Boa noite. Eu sou Cristiano Laurino, atual presidente da Sociedade Brasileira de Artroscopia e Traumatologia do Esporte, a SBRAT. E em nome da SBRAT e da SBOT, gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos uh, e do Dr. Brian Cole e dizer que é uma honra tê-lo conosco nesse evento de Educação Médica Continuada. O Dr. Cole apresentará a sua experiência e conhecimento nas lesões da cartilagem articular com o tema Tomada de Decisão no Paciente Ativo com Doença da Cartilagem Articular. Gostaria também de informar a todos que nós teremos uma tradução simultânea e que o Dr. Lúcia Lund será o moderador para as perguntas dos espectadores ao final da aula, onde teremos alguns minutos para as respostas. Para quem não conhece, o Dr. Brian Cole é presidente associado, professor do Departamento de Ortopedia do Centro Médico da Universidade de Rush, presidente de cirurgia do Hospital Rush Oak Park, chefe do Centro de Pesquisa e Restauração da Cartilagem do Centro Médico da Universidade de Rush e é um autor de várias técnicas inovadoras para o tratamento de lesões de ombro, cotovelo e joelho. É o atual presidente da Associação de Artroscopia da América do Norte e também ocupa várias outras posições de liderança nas sociedades ortopédicas nacionais e internacionais. Dr. Cole é médico também da equipe do Chicago Bulls e também médico da equipe de, do White Sox. Agora eu vou passar a palavra ao Dr. Lúcio Lund para moderar a apresentação. Lúcio? Boa noite, Brian. Boa noite, Cris. Boa noite a todos. É uma grande satisfação uh, eu, como ex-presidente da SBRAT, uh, me unir, vol voltar aqui à SBRAT né, e podemos ter o nosso convidado internacional, Dr. Brian Cole, uh, um colega, amigo de, de, de fellowship nos Estados Unidos, de 96, 97. Tivemos o privilégio de trabalhar juntos durante esse período. E é uma grande satisfação tê-lo aqui nesse período de pandemia, né, que cada um estamos fazendo o possível para melhorar o nosso a troca de informação e, e a troca de, de conhecimento internacional, que é tão importante para nós. Então, Brian Cole, nosso amigo, por favor, sua aula, por gentileza. Lucio, thank you, and uh, I appreciate the honor of uh, having the opportunity to share information uh, internationally like this. It's Uh, as we say, it's uh, unprecedented times, but it's also uh, provided the opportunity to have unique experiences like this and to share and to continue learning together and also to continue to foster our friendships. So, Lucio, it's great to see you and uh, thank you for, again, for providing the opportunity. Uh, we talked about uh, what we would discuss tonight and I thought what I would do is provide an overview of our philosophy and one that can be generalized even to your country and uh, how we manage cartilage repair specifically to active individuals. Uh, for disclosures and conflicts, uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons website is where one would go for that. We've probably published uh, more than 500 peer-reviewed articles to date on cartilage and outcomes and I would tell you that uh, none of this ever gets done without having a, a team in place. Um, we have a robust database now with over 800 osteochondral allografts and 700 meniscal transplants that have been accumulated over the last 23 years. And it's largely not because of me, but because I have just some excellent people who are highly engaged and contribute and take a lot of pride in what they do day in and day out. And, We also have a lot of fun doing it. What's interesting is that when we look at our elite athletes, we find that cartilage lesions are actually very pre prevalent. Uh, meniscal lesions are very prevalent. And we can ask ourselves, how do we compare when we don't play an elite sport? There's a wonderful author, Atul Gawande, who wrote a book called Being Mortal. And in that book, he discusses how, we're, as we age, we're sort of rotting or deteriorating from the inside out. And what's interesting is that if you just look at our younger counterparts, the incidence of those less than 40 is about four to 14%. So it takes, it takes off about 20 years if you compete in a very, very high level sport in terms of advancing the incidence of cartilage disease. One of the biggest challenges we have is that Articular cartilage problems, even though we know the frequency and prevalence is quite high, 
imaging often has a very significant disconnect with what we see, for example, arthroscopically. On the left are two images and on the right is our arthroscopic video. And you can see significant delamination, the subcondyl plate, yet deep edema and overload of the trochlear lesion, but one would never expect this degree of articular cartilage damage. We've also learned over the last several years about the subcondyl state and what it really means. And I would encourage you not to think of the subcondyl bone as a lesion, but rather as an area of overload um, related to insufficiency in the cartilage and the joint itself. But it's not a lesion, it's a sign of load being transmitted to other surfaces. So treatment that's dedicated on load reduction and not necessarily on eliminating the lesion itself. What's also interesting is despite the prevalence that I showed you, that most of these lesions have a very innocuous or benign natural history. In fact, when we look at our ACL population, those who are identified as having a cartilage defect at the time of ACL reconstruction look very similar 10 years later if their defect remains untreated at their time the ACL is reconstructed. So in truth, very few patients have symptoms related to a cartilage defect at the time, at least, of an ACL reconstruction. What's also frequently asked is that if we participate in sports, will it actually make the condition worse? And what's interesting is if you look at individuals who are chronic marathoners, in this study from Philadelphia, these individuals had an average of 76 marathons over 19 years, yet had no increased prevalence of hip or knee arthritis. We've looked at the world's literature to see if there was any suggestion that participation in sports might increase the incidence. And really, there's insufficient evidence that suggests that sports will materially increase the risk of knee arthritis. It then begs the question as to why some people hurt. And I would always ask you to think about load as to why people hurt. This is a collegiate level uh, football player or in your world football and our world soccer, who has a 15 millimeter lesion of her medial femoral condyle that was treated with microfracture. She had pretty good fibrocartilage fill, but no change in her symptoms. And it's a very small lesion, yet we replace that with an osteochondral allograft. And you have to be mindful that it's the lesion size relative to the intact area that may be important to consider as to why people hurt. A very small femoral condyle, but a small defect with only a small area of remaining intact cartilage leads to high load across that deficient area. So think about the comorbidities, the body mass, alignment, meniscal deficiency, the condition of the other surface, and even psychological factors that weigh in. We're often asked about the role of defect size, and I would submit to you that defect size is relevant. We have shown that defect size uh, relative to the uh, size of the femoral condyle is directly proportional to failure after we treat cartilage defects. So it definitely has a role, but the other comorbidities have to be taken into consideration and the absolute defect size is not the only reigning factor. So it's all of these things that I'm alluding to, not just the fact that a patient does or does not have a cartilage defect, but has all of these other issues. And when you're dealing with competitive athletes, there's also the system that they function in. There could be the contract, there could be the general manager, there could be the trainers. But the things that you and I see on a daily basis involve all of these things that you're seeing here, and they must be taken into consideration when considering treatment. So we still continue to reserve non-operative treatment in patients who have the acute onset of symptoms where their performance is maintained. Maybe their performance is compromised, but they're actually playing for something. However, operative treatment, we often think about when their performance is impaired, if they have actually failed non-operative treatment, or maybe they're early in a contract and they have the time to actually get better while they're still under contract, if we're talking about a competitive athlete. It's important to understand that many of our patients do very well with very little. I would say over the years I've learned this goes a long way and we're often managing anxiety and uncertainty. And in fact, one thing to think about is that the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. And that's a, that's a statement by Voltaire 
who talks about what really happens in medicine. And most of the time, we're actually providing reassurance to alleviate anxiety and uncertainty. We have a number of alternatives that are non-surgical like you see here. Some of them are proven and some of them are not. And what you see here are a litany of things that still have to be taken into consideration when you're, when you're recommending treatment, whether it's surgical or non-surgical. Some of the non-surgical become very interested in is the use of PRP to modify symptoms. And this is a study where we compared three injections of high molecular weight hyaluronic acid to three injections of PRP, leukocyte poor. And we showed that their IKDC scores and their visual analog scores were actually better at six months and 12 months compared to hyaluronic acid alone. When you look at the world's literature, the level one and level two studies, there's actually very good evidence that leukocyte poor PRP remains a dominant treatment strategy. So think about this in your treatment. We've also learned that combination of leukocyte poor PRP with hyaluronic acid can be synergistic. This has been looked at in vivo. It's been looked at in vitro. And my current algorithm now is that patients will still often be treated with corticosteroids. And if they get three months of relief that's satisfactory, we might even repeat it. But if they get less than three months or incomplete relief, we are now combining three injections of hyaluronic acid with three injections of PRP simultaneously and seeing very good results to placate or temporize a patient's symptoms. A lot of these individuals cannot be kept on the court or on the field with non-surgical means. And those who undergo surgery have failed non-surgical treatment. They have unacceptable pain and dysfunction. We need to actually ask them, what would you like to see improve to meet your goals or expectations? And will the solution predictably deliver with minimal risk and meaningful upside? So when you're dealing with athletes, there's a number of concerns, such as separating concern from disability. Is their inability to perform gonna make them unemployable? We choose treatment that might or may not affect their asset value, such as marrow stimulation. We know we do a very good job of improving activities they're living, but less good when we're talking about return to high level sports. We're very careful to try to match the solution to the desired outcome and the athlete's available timeline. And we try to choose solutions that don't burn bridges. And one thing that we've learned in managing some of our highest level individuals is that the past can predict the future. If you can get an athlete back for an entire season, despite their condition, their asset value actually improves and might even stabilize because moving forward, they may actually do very, very well because they have a year behind them proving that they can actually do well with the treatment that's rendered. But it's very important to manage their expectations because unlike a lot of things that we do where we can turn their pain off and normalize their function, managing cartilage problems is an entirely different entity because it often just dims the lights but doesn't eliminate their pain. So managing the patient's expectations, the system's expectations, that a good outcome may not be associated with no pain. These are the options and these are the at least in the United States. Debridement is still very commonly performed, but we know it doesn't generate anything re uh, in terms of regenerative tissue. Marrow stimulation is still performed frequently. We now have variants of the theme with marrow stimulation that can be served as an adjunct to marrow stimulation to improve those outcomes. We have surface allograft treatments such as de novo or cardiform, which are surface allografts. Osteocon autographs are still form, performed frequently, and I know that that's something that you do in your country because you don't often have readily available osteochondral allografts. MACI or ACI is still performed now about 1,500 to 2,000 times a year in the United States. That's autologous chondrocyte implantation. But I would argue that it, it, in our highest level athletes, at least in the United States, the mainstay of treatment is an osteochondral allograft. The algorithms can be very complex. And when people say, well, how do you decide? If I have season with new mechanical symptoms, we will often recommend debridement. If they're in mid season, but no mechanical symptoms, we start to look at the location and size of the defect. If it's a patellofemoral joint, we may perform marrow stimulation because they may not get better with debridement or a procedure I'll show you called autocard. If it's the tibial from a joint, there are more versatile options available. If it's very large lesions, we often can still uh, deploy cell transplantation, but 
osteochondrographing, as I mentioned, still continues to be the mainstay, even for the patellofemoral joints. But as I mentioned, the mainstay, the, what we call the workhorse, are for large, deep defects, revision treatment, bipolar defects, those with concomitant pathology, it's the osteochondral allograft. What really happens is that we offer debridement, and then maybe marrow stimulation and osteochondral grafting, and what I would call poly treatment, patients who have problems with the meniscus, they're malaligned, and yes, they also have an articular cartilage problem. So I'll finish my talk by going through a, a few case examples to help emphasize the decision-making that I've described in terms of the solutions that are available. This is a professional basketball player in his second season. He was complaining of catch. He had intermittent swelling, inability to perform, and his left knee had effusions and crepitus, but otherwise a normal physical exam. At the time of arthroscopy, he had this defect of the patella, unstable articular cartilage. The treatment was debridement, no marrow stimulation. He needed to get back quickly, was complaining of mechanical symptoms, and we added bone marrow concentrate to reduce inflammation, not necessarily to regenerate. He also had some degenerative state of his trochlea. The outcome was actually very good with just simple debridement. He has no restrictions after three weeks. He's two years out playing well and he has no further complaints. This is a 29 year old, 10 year veteran, professional basketball player. Four to six weeks of painful effusions. He's had some in-season injections that worked at first, but his play was compromised. At the time of arthroscopy, he had far more damage than anyone would have anticipated by the MRI I just showed you. The meniscus is torn to the periphery, non-functional, his tibia has significant degenerative changes, and his femur has reciprocal changes as well. And one would say this particular individual may never get back to his pre-injury or pre-symptomatic state. And this, in that patient, six weeks of post-operative pain and swelling resolved. We gave him PRP and hyaluronic acid post-operatively. And five years later, he still has a veteran contract with no symptoms and no additional treatment required. We, or I became initially interested when we looked at our outcomes following a biopsy for people who would undergo cell transplantation. And what we found is that patients with smaller defects, 44% of them never went on to implantation because they reported symptom relief with their debridement. We've recently learned through some work looking at contact forces across the joint that if you make the defect with vertical walls rather than beveled edges, like you see here, the loads that are transmitted to the defect are protected. So you can actually change the configuration to make it biomechanically more hospitable. It goes back to that concept of load. If you can change the load parameters that cross the joint, even with reducing their malalignment, reducing their body mass index, improving their adduction moment, improving their strength, sharing load with orthotics, all of those things are viable ways that can sort of trick the body into believing that the cartilage defect actually has less relevance. We know that the factors of debridement are dependent upon comorbidities. Size seems to matter when it comes to comorbidities, as well as having concurrent meniscus pathology. Those patients have, should have expect, their expectations tempered. Here's another example that I'll play for you just to listen to the video. And Lucio, if you cannot hear the video, I would ask that you tell me and I'll just uh, uh, speak over it. I'll start the video now. Or uh, currently a 20 year old college student at a division one school and you played point guard. And two years ago, you had a left knee debridement for a patella cartilage defect and you were able to get back to play pretty reliably and had no problems. However, over the last three weeks, no injury you can cite. You've had right knee pain mm -hmm. that's really inhibited your ability to play for more than two to three minutes before you get pain and swelling. Correct. You do not recall an injury? No. Where's the pain located? On the right side of my knee and I'm kind of over here on the patella. On some, on the okay. Since this started, have you limited your play or are you just trying to push through it? Just trying to push through it. And have you been suffering for that in terms of discomfort? Yes. And has your performance been compromised? Yes. Okay. Um, your goal is to play how many more years? Two more years. And have you ever redshirted or taken a medical redshirt? No. You have a redshirt remaining now, is that correct? Correct. How many more games could you play before that would be compromised? 
um, six more games. So if you played six more games, you would no longer have the option to take the medical red shirt. Correct. And then you might miss a year of school if you of play, unless you got a medical red shirt, correct. which is another way to get around it. So we're spending a lot of time talking about his, his college coming out and so forth. And you can see it's not only about his symptoms, right? It's also about what, he's, uh, what he uh, has ahead of him and how much time he or, has. Uh, currently a 20 year old. Here's a few more details about this guy. If you went for surgical treatment, what would be your primary goal? What would be a meaningful outcome to you? Uh, being able to play at least a lot Okay. And if it meant a shorter procedure, meaning a, a quicker return to play with the risk of symptoms coming back or completely being resolved versus a little longer recovery by maybe eight weeks to 12 weeks with a more reliable reduction in pain, just being one surgery, what would you pick uh, the longer recovery time? So we ask, those, you, we ask those questions because we want to know what his appetite is from a recovery perspective and what he needs. But then when we get in there arthroscopically, and I, what I think I'm gonna do is just go back and show you his imaging. You know, you see subchondral edema, a defect, never had treatment, right? He has time to get better. And then he has this lesion here. And you have to ask yourself, what would I do to treat this defect? If I trim this area off here, is that gonna get him better? My answer is in the absence of mechanical symptoms, weight bearing pain, I'm not so sure. We know that a subchondral bone has edema, so it's being overloaded. It's not a lesion. It didn't just show up and it causes pain. It's a secondary phenomenon due to the defect itself. So the treatment, it's a long, narrow defect. Not a lot of great options. Could do uh, autographs in, uh, next to each other, but it gets very small. That defect is more than, more, no more than four to six millimeters in some areas. There's a lot of challenges with marrow stimulation, which is why we drill. One of the things we've learned is that when we do a microfracture all, it compacts the bone. We see subchondral cysts and intralesional osteophytes. So we've begun drilling these for those reasons. Marrow stimulation has actually done very well, even in very high level athletes. 83% return to play in the NBA, 75% return to play in the NFL. If you look across all these sports in a public database, we don't do too badly when it's well indicated about 80% return to play overall in all of these individual sports. We've learned, however, that microfracture can do better if we use a drill versus an awl. This is a patient who had a awl with subchondral edema. This is a patient who was drilled with much less subchondral edema. We've learned that our revision rates when we use a drill versus an awl are about half. So now we no longer use an awl, which causes impaction and may lead to cystic formation. But the most important aspect of microfracture is to make sure that we protect the weight bearing for the tibial femoral joint. Now, this is a technology that you should pay attention to because I'm aware that it may be difficult to get an osteochondral allograft. This is a very inexpensive way to obtain autogenous tissue. We can go to the intercondylar notch. We can collect it in this vesicle called a graft net. This has maintained cell viability. We can combine it with PRP and maybe biocartilage, which is a scaffold and then we can perform marrow stimulation. We can inject this mixture of biocartilage, autologous cartilage, and growth factors into the defect, placing fibrin glue over the area. And this is a single stage autogenous transplant, if you will, very inexpensive, and has a foundation of basic science supporting its efficacy. That patient I showed you never got better. We tried HA and PRP. He continued to complain of sharp lateral pain, and this is his MRI and follow-up. And this is his second look arthroscopy. And he had beautiful fibrocartilage fill, but it was not enough for him. So he ended up being treated with a revision. And we used two small osteochondral allografts placed adjacent to one another. And that was the only thing we could do to actually get him better. So unfortunately, he failed and succeeded with revision with an osteochondral allograft. This is another case example excuse me, previous left knee arthroscopy with a known small cartilage defect that you see here, lateral sided knee pain. This is an excellent option for an osteochondral autograph. There's some tibial disease there that required a microfracture, but about an 11 millimeter defect. We can treat that with a single osteochondral autograph plug. I would argue that osteochondral autograft is a dominant treatment strategy for an active patient when they have small defects. 
and this patient can return to sport predictably about 75% of the time or more with a single plug osteochondral autograph within four months. This is a little bit older patient with a previous ACL and a previous marrow stimulation of, of the medial from Oconda who cannot play, who's contemplating retirement. He has a known trochlear defect and a medial from Oconda defect. A large defect in the medial side, large trochlear defect, both of which were treated with an osteochondral allograft, as you see here. He returned to play in 14 months for another 18 months. He never felt perfect, but he said he could play. He complained of occasional achiness. He's still playing, but he's now a coach and he still has symptom relief, but I would argue he would never say he was perfect, but it was serviceable allowing him to return for at least 18 months. This is a trochlear defect in a hockey player, a large defect as you see here. Debridement failed and came back for treatment, which was an osteochondral allograft, and has had gotten to the point now where he has absolutely no pain along the anterior aspect of his knee. So how do we decide? I showed you a number of treatments and decision-making is probably the most interesting yet biggest challenge. We've certainly seen a number of trends in the United States, looking at restorative procedures versus repair procedures versus those that you call palliative, such as debridement. In general, there's been a decrease in the use of marrow stimulation and an increase in the use of osteochondral allograft transplantation. We've learned a lot about osteochondral allografts. In terms of the indications and the outcomes, we know that we can treat OCD, avas and necrosis, the patellofemoral joint, and we know that survivorship overall is about 75% at 10 to 12 years. When we look at special situations, females and males fare similarly. Those over 40 can do very well if you stick to the indications. If they've had a previous marrow stimulation, they can still do very well. We also know that overlapping grafts can do extremely well, like I showed you, and even grafts in multiple locations. When they fail, which happens about 25% of the time, we can revise them and still achieve a success rate of about 75%, depending upon how they fail. Our overall results in athletes with an osteochondral allograft are about 75 to 88%. I've alluded to the fact that patients don't always present with just a cartilage defect, but they might have malalignment or meniscal deficiency. Those are the two most common comorbidities. This is a woman who does uh, tennis, plays tennis, uh, and aerobic exercise, had a very straightforward meniscal tear, intact articular cartilage. Six months later, this is what happened. Subcondyl edema as a secondary response, progressive degeneration of her femur, which was intact at the index procedure. That treatment that she ended up with was an osteochondral allograft and a meniscal transplant. How do we do in this population? Meniscal allografts can get an athlete back to sport 75 to 85% of the time. Another individual with malalignment, the other comorbidity, with a focal defect of the femur, he plays professional football, American football. A realignment procedure to unload him, which we do anytime we can possibly do it, as well as an osteochondral allograft. Another professional soccer player, same thing, but in valgus. We correct their alignment and we do an osteochondral allograft. Osteotomy is a forgiving procedure that even when performed alone, can get an individual back to high level sports. So we never leave that out of the equation if we can avoid it. So key takeaways. There is a large incidence of cartilage abnormalities. Keep in mind, they may never cause symptoms. And in fact, we've learned that benign neglect is a very useful solution for the majority of patients if we can encourage them to remain active despite having some symptoms. Whatever plan you choose, it has to meet the athlete's expectations. And mostly they're looking for reductions in pain to improve their performance. What we're not doing is something that's preventative. Skillful neglect, as I talked about, is acceptable as long as they can tolerate their pain and their performance is not sufficiently compromised. And the other rule in managing active patients is to do the least amount necessary to achieve a successful outcome. I think that's an important tenant given the variability that we have across all these procedures. Choose the operation that is the least amount necessary to give them a positive outcome. So I'll stop there. And uh, I think Lucio was going to moderate. I will stop sharing my computer and I'd be happy to take any questions. And I wanna thank you for your attention.
Olá, Brian. Muito obrigado pela, pela excelente palestra. É uma satisfação muito grande ouvi-lo. Todo esse conhecimento técnico de tantos anos acumulados, né, com quase com 500 trabalhos publicados e assim por diante. É, nós temos algumas perguntas aqui, Brian. E a pergunta do nosso amigo Mário Ferretti, uh, que também esteve com o doutor Fred Fu, enquanto nós estivemos uh, também alguns anos com o Fred Fu, seis anos trabalhando com ele. E qual é a frequência de osteotomia da tuberosidade anterior da tíbia para tratar lesão condral patelar? E quais tipos de osteotomias você usa? Thank you. So, patellar femoral lesions, just like tibial femoral lesions, need to be unloaded when it makes sense. Distal lateral and patella lesions and lateral trochlear lesions are uniquely unloaded with a tibial tubercle osteotomy. I often hear people say that the patient has never dislocated their patella or they have no malalignment or their TT, TG is normal at 15 to 18. That's not the discussion. The discussion is we're trying to take advantage of anything possible to reduce the load across the joint. And that's what an osteotomy does. Now I do not do a McKay osteotomy when their TT, TG is normal. But what we do do is a very vertical cut of the tibial tubercle to minimize the amount of medialization but to maximize the amount of anteriorization, so much so that the screws can actually go from lateral to medial, right? So you can do a vertical cut, stop short of the posterior cortex, shingle the bone forward, hinge it forward, and that will reduce the contact forces by about 30% in the central and even medial trochlea. The times I do not do a tibial tubercle osteotomy are when I think that load is a little less relevant. They have lots of biologic symptoms like achiness and swelling, and it's a central or medial defect of the trochlea. Those patients, I may avoid doing a tibia tubercle osteotomy. I would prefer not to do it for certain athletes, especially those who are on their knees like volleyball players and things of that nature. But sometimes it requires the combination of unloading with a cartilage procedure, just like a varus or valgus osteotomy. The challenge is we choose a varus or valgus osteotomy based upon the x-rays. We choose a tibial tubercle osteotomy based upon the location of the defect and the nature of their symptoms. Because even without malalignment, we still do it with proper located, properly located defects. So that's sort of a synopsis. It's a much more lengthy explanation I do it probably 75% of the time. É, Brian, você, no caso de uma de uma osteotomia, né, para correção de varo ou valgo, você considera também fazer um raio-x em em perfil que seja long standing, seja um raio-x que pegue uh, do quadril até o tornozelo? Você tem essa preocupação de também avaliar em em perfil? Their profile. Yeah, I'm talking. I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you do a lateral view, a long-standing cassette lateral view for the this this type of patients. Uh, yeah, so you you can if you have a recurvatum or you you have any type of uh, defect in the femur that makes it, uh, uh, you know, to, to correct anterior posterior side, yeah, not just sagittal. lateral lateral. Okay. Yes, yeah, sagittal. Yeah. Um, The sagittal plane for me, and this may be a very uneducated answer, believe it or not. The sagittal plane for me is mostly relevant in a setting of ACL or PCL problems, previous reconstruction, things like that. But your question is a good one because I only really perform opening wedge lateral osteotomies and opening wedge medial, opening wedge lateral femoral osteotomies and opening wedge tibial osteotomies medially. But I think that's a very unsophisticated answer, to be quite frank. 
And I used to perform medial or lateral closing wedge tibial osteotomies. That's a good operation for the right patient. Similarly, a medial osteotomy for the femur is a good operation. Similarly, you can correct valgus deformity with a medial closing tibial osteotomy. So I would tell you that I personally think intellectually, I need to evolve to customize the osteotomy to take into consideration and much more beyond the ACL and the PCL in the sagittal plane, because I think that will weigh into how we decide what kind of osteotomy to do. If you really want to do this as perfect as possible, we probably need to have a much broader view of what type of osteotomy to do. But the honest answer, Lucio, is that I take the sagittal plane into consideration only when I'm dealing with ACL deficiency to decrease the tibial slope or PCL to increase it, to take advantage of the biplanar correction. But that's a very narrow way to look at it. And I, being critical of my thinking, I think we need to look beyond that. OK. Uh, OK. A outra pergunta que eu tenho aqui é do Adriano Almeida, também da Sociedade da Esbrat, também da, da diretoria da Esbrat. E ele quer saber quando o atleta volta a jogar, qual o tempo médio que o atleta volta a jogar após um transplante osteocondral de modo geral, obviamente, são casos, cada caso é um caso, né? mas em, em, minhas, em minhas médias, quanto tempo ele volta? So, so the, first, the, the, the first part of the answer is that I allow impact activities like running, jumping, ballistic activities of the tibial femoral joint at eight months. Of the patella femoral joint, it's six months. So what you have to do, and that's based upon some data that looks at the biology of the bone. The problem with the osteochondral allograft is that the living bone is a very hostile healing environment. The cartilage we want to live, we wish the bone were dead. If the bone were dead, it would undergo creeping substitution much quicker. That's not generally what happens with living bone. It has marrow elements, even if we wash them away. It's uh, antigenic, it has a Im potential for immune reaction and resorption. So the length of time is more to do with the bone than it does the cartilage. So what's necessary, if you think about the, the depending on the sport that the athlete does, what's necessary is to rehabilitate them around the fact that you're not going to allow them to run or do ballistic activities until eight months. So that when that time comes, most of all their other skills are there and they can start running. So it takes a long time because we uh, running is such an important part of all of the sports that we take care of. But you don't want to just let them languish for eight months. You rehab every way you possibly can. Blood flow restriction, cardio, bike, elliptical, versa climber, anything you can do in the water, in the pool, anything you can do short of high impact activities. Then when you can allow that, the time remaining is how long does it take them to get to be an athlete again? And that depends on the sport. So you could argue if it's a tennis player, they're doing lots and lots of tennis, they're not running. Once they can run pretty quickly, they can get back. Not the same thing maybe for um, a rugby player, or a, a soccer or football, you know? So the thing you need to know is how long do you have to protect the graft? And then as sports medicine physicians, we have to learn how to rehabilitate them around their treatment so you don't waste a whole bunch of time when you're allowed to free them up to start running. E, e como você avalia, avalia o enxerto para dizer que o enxerto está num bom momento para você liberar outro atleta? There's a uh, couple descriptions of uh, the value of the MRI. Uh, one is technology over reason. The other is uh, we, you have an expression uh, in the United States called barf. Lucio, if I said to you the word barf, do you know what it means? No. It means to throw up. Okay. You must have some word in Portuguese that means to throw up. Vomito. Vomito, all right. So vomit. Vomit. Vomit, the acronym is a victim of modern imaging 
technology. <laughs> okay? okay, that's what vomit. Excellent. Is. That's good. So, <laughs> so we cannot use the MRI to tell us yes or no. They mostly look terrible. Whenever you look at them, there's very little correlation with clinical outcome. There is clinical correlation with graph thickness and size. You can find lots of literature that talk about what leads to the changes on the MRI. You can't find anything in our own experience of over 800 graphs that suggest that the findings on MRI can be used to return or not return an athlete back to play. And the most frustrating, challenging aspect of managing a high level athlete who has lots of resources is the MRI because you have to sit and explain all these findings and help them understand that they're not important when the graph looks terrible. The cartilage looks good, but the bone has cystic changes in fluid and so forth. And um, we don't even know what the, 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 the relevance of those findings are. It's the same thing with meniscus transplants. Half of our meniscus transplants are extruded at two years. That has no correlation with how they feel clinically. É. Outra pergunta que nós temos aqui é do André Luiz Siqueira Campos. Uh, gostaria de saber, doutor, qual, qual a sua preferência de lesões bifocais em, em espelho patelofemorais? Tróclea e patela. Yeah. So this is what we've learned. And um, the great thing about collecting data is I've been able to ask all these questions to say, what about being male? What about being female? What if the tibia has a lesion but no edema? What if the tibia has edema? Um, how, what if you treat the femur and ignore the tibia and do the meniscus transplant and an osteoconiograph but don't do anything to the tibia? And here's, I'm gonna give you 23 years of ex experience in a, just a couple of sentences. What I've learned is that the tibia contributes less to symptoms than the femur. And you can tolerate some tibial disease at, as long as you treat the femur and replace the meniscus and correct the malalignment. And, and, whether, and, and if you want to do marrow stimulation or other, that is a, not a bad thing to do. The thing that leads to a bad outcome is when the tibia has lots of subchondral edema, those patients don't do as well. But if you have articular cartilage loss in the tibia, we don't have a lot of great options because the access is so difficult. The good news is that patients tolerate tibial disease very well. We found that same thing in the glenohumeral joint to the shoulder. You can often take a young person and do an allograph of the humeral head and ignore the glenoid, and they also can do very, very well. So good news is, the bad news is that tibia doesn't have easy solutions other than marrow stimulation. Maybe you could do that autocar procedure where you put minced cartilage. The good news is that you might not have to do too much and the patient can still do well. I will tell you that if you're on the fence, you're thinking about whether or not you want to do an osteotomy or not, if they have tibial disease and they're on the fence, do the osteotomy because those are the ones who will benefit the most from a realignment procedure. Cool. Qual a sua opinião? Qual a sua opinião sobre a subcondroplastia uh, para o edema ósseo em atletas profissionais? Early in my talk, I spoke about edema, and I told you that it's a secondary phenomenon related to an incompetent articular surface. It is nothing more than a sign of load being transmitted to the bone. It is not a lesion. So if you're thinking about it as we must get rid of that lesion, don't think about the secondary phenomenon, think about the primary problem to get rid of the secondary problem. So lose some weight. Maybe you reduce your activities. Not, not a good solution for a professional athlete. The main indication to treat the bone in my practice is they have pain in the bone. If they hurt in that area, I might inject something there. Currently, I do a trocar, I take demineralized bone matrix and bone marrow concentrate, and I do multiple drill holes and I inject the area. As the only time I would do it as isolated treatment would be if they just hurt with bone pain. 
But if you could realign those people, you should do that. If you could treat the surface in an effective way, you should do that too. But in a professional athlete with isolated edema, with no cartilage loss, maybe that could be an isolated treatment. And we've done that. The good news is that's not a very common finding. Mostly what you're seeing is an incompetent articular surface with excessive loads being transmitted to the bone. So I think it has a role, but not in the role that the company who sells the equipment initially intended. Qual a sua opinião sobre a uh, uh, sobre o uso? Desculpe, só um momento. Qual a sua opinião sobre o uso de de, de AMIC, uh, a a a m i c para melhorar o resultado de microfraturas? Yeah. In Germany, when the cells were no longer reimbursed, they were pretty much left with non-cell transplant procedures. And they gained an, an incredible experience of the use of a collagen 1-3 membrane placed on top of a microfracture defect. And the results were very good. So I am, having been involved with some of the basic science with a collagen membrane, Chondrocytes love collagen, fibroblasts love collagen. They guide development of fibrocartilage. I actually am very supportive. So if you tell me that I can't get an osteochondral allograft in Sao Paulo, I would say to you, you have these options available and you just do it a different way. And there's nothing to be ashamed of. It can be very effective. Clearly you will have problems that you cannot correct without an osteochondral allograft. And uh, Lucio has, and I have had a long relationship and friendship. Occasionally I get patients from Brazil because you can't have access to some things that we have. Maybe that's changed, but there's a lot of problems that you can solve in your country where you don't need to have an osteochondral allograft. And I think amic procedure is one of those things that is economically very responsible and can lead to a good result when used appropriately. Keep in mind that you can't expect to get a good result by using amic and ignoring the fact that the meniscus is missing or ignoring the fact that the patient is in varus or valgus. Just because it's easy to do AMIC doesn't mean that you can take the liberties to not treat the other problems. You're not going to get a good result with any treatment if you ignore comorbidities. O que você pensa em um edema ósseo com dor incapacitante para o esporte? sem lesão uh, uh, condral, é, e acho que essa que já foi respondida, na realidade, desculpa, é, subcondroplastia. Sub mas essa é a única paciente que eu considero subcondroplastia, sim. Yes. É, qual a abordagem de lesões condrais isoladas no planalto tibial? Um, What we have found is number one, they're very rare, thankfully, because we don't have lots of options. I have done retrograde oats, which is technically very difficult, where you drill from underneath and pass a plug from underneath to flush up the surface. That is a brutally difficult operation. There's only two instrument sets, I think, in the United States from Arthrex to do it. Um, I have done lots of microfracture with good results Now I use the autocart procedure that I showed you where we take minced cartilage, mix it with biocartilage, which is a scaffold, and add bone marrow concentrate or PRP into a paste, drill the area, put that paste on top and put fibrin glue over it, and absolute non-weight bearing for eight weeks. And that's been very good. I've probably performed over I don't know, let's just say if I added microfracture oats and cell transplants and allografts, 3,000 transplants. I'll just throw a number out there. Maybe I've treated 15 tibial defects in 23 years. So the good news is they're rare. The better news is they actually do okay in general. I, I, thankfully, because I don't know what to do if they still hurt. I mean, what are you going to do if you fail miserably with an isolated tibial defect 
in a well-aligned knee who has an intact meniscus and no femoral disease. That's a brutal, difficult problem. Uh, eu vou falar, I will speak in English now because uh, Pedro de B, de, de B que visitou, has visited you last year. Yeah, Pedro. Uh, uh, he said, hi, Dr. Cole. Uh, what would be your mindset in deciding between Macy, uh, including sandwich technique, versus the osteochondral allograft? My main indications for Macy are young patients with delamination injuries with good quality bone, preferably never treated before, multiple locations, preferably the patellofemoral joint. If I have an osteochondral lesion, because I get osteochondral grafts, I would never do a sandwich technique. If you can't get an osteochondral graft, if you want to do a sandwich technique, at least the reported outcomes from Tom Minus and Lars Peterson are pretty good. But I think it's a, not, it's, it just, it's a lot of biology and too much variability and too vulnerable. And it doesn't, I mean, there's no reason to do it. I would argue that you could bone graft a defect and let fibrocartilage fill come in and you could do very well as well. So I worry a little bit, it's very expensive. You're looking for a bilayer or two layers, you know? So I would never do a sandwich, but that's also because I have the luxury of having access to osteochondral grafts. If you do a sandwich technique, you might do very well. I would submit to you that the bone grafting is as important as anything with the sandwich technique. Uh, nós temos mais cinco minutos e eu tenho mais uma pergunta aqui que é do qual é o papel uh, dos tratamentos biológicos como PRP, BMAC ou gordura, gordura autóloga nos atletas? Como você avalia isso? Como e quando? One of the comments I made is that um, we, we not uncommonly will use treatments that have unproven benefits. And as long as we don't hurt our patients or our athletes. And frankly, um, people get better for a lot of reasons. The least of which is the biologic activity of the things we inject. We did a study where we looked at the level one outcomes of patients who had hyaluronic acid in the randomized controlled double blind studies against a placebo. And placebo injections had a 35% response rate with the same MCID, the minimally clinically important difference as hyaluronic acid. So you as a doctor are in a very privileged position to make people better. I would argue that there isn't a single injection you can do that will regenerate anything in a symptomatic joint at this time. That being said, I think there's some benefits to leukocyte poor PRP in an arthritic joint in reducing symptoms. I believe it. I think those results are very real. I think high molecular weight hyaluronic acid with PRP, leukocyte poor, is a very good option. I am not yet believing that bone marrow concentrate or adipose tissue to deliver growth factors to modulate the inflammatory environment is clinically making a difference beyond the placebo effect. It's also not convenient in the office. I know people do it, but I have personally, this is my answer, so it's what I call level five evidence. I have not subscribed to the routine use of bone marrow concentrate or adipose tissue in the office. As an adjunct to surgery, I don't have any problem with it. No downside. It's not painful, obviously. It can't hurt. It might help patients and athletes feel like they're getting the entire package. That has an effect up here. Whether it makes a difference, honestly, I do not know. Uma, te... Queremos uma, mas só duas é, perguntas. Nós temos apenas dois minutos. E um atleta de alto nível, né, de NFL ou é, qualquer uma das ligas americanas, com lesão da cartilagem do joelho submetido a tratamento cirúrgico, retorna à atividade em qual nível? Na média.
The answer is it depends. Um, because in one week I had a uh, defensive end who is plays on defense, who plays on, if you know NFL football, if you don't, they just, they are thinner and taller and very lean. Then I also had a offense, uh, offensive tackle who's very big, 350 pounds. They both got the same operation. The offensive tackle, who was 350 pounds, never got back. The defensive end is still in his third year after an osteochondral graft and osteotomy. I have a couple of professional football or your soccer players. Those are the real athletes. They're built pretty well. They don't have excess BMIs. If they have elevated BMI, they're usually very tall. Those athletes can do well with those procedures. The problem with collision sports and the NFL is they are just big people. And it goes back to the most basic of all phenomenon, and that's load. The higher the load, the more difficult challenge you and I have to make someone better. So people say, well, you'll never get an, an NFL player back with an osteotomy. You can't do an osteotomy. If they don't get back, it's not because you did an osteotomy. It's because they have a terribly difficult problem that the osteotomy couldn't solve, do you know, right? So yeah, too big. yeah, yeah, they just don't get better. So it takes a lot of, cons you, you want the athlete to tell you in the office that I very much want to play. And if I do nothing, I cannot play. And I understand that you might improve my quality of life and that that's good. And that I might not get back, but I have a desire to play for one, two, three, four more years, because that's the only way that I'm going to make a living. So I'm willing to take the chance. But, you, you know, so the statistics, you can't lump them together. And we don't, unfortunately, I don't have enough. Nobody has enough athletes of different sports and different positions because most of them, frankly, never come to this point. It's the rare athlete that you and I see that we will try this on because for all the other intangible reasons, we just don't do it. It takes a very intelligent, informed athlete to undergo these procedures. And everyone has to be willing to accept failure, including the doctor. You know, most of my athletes come from other teams because the doctors are afraid of failure and they would much rather have me have the failure than them. Elsewhere. Right. Right. And right. I understand that. I don't, I, there's no judgment placed on that. I get that. I'm not invested by the, with the team, but I'm certainly yeah. invested in getting the athlete back. And I can completely understand someone thinking that way. And it's not because they're cowards or afraid. It's a challenging situation, so let someone else have that burden, and you don't want that conflicting your team relationship. Sure, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Brian, muito obrigado pela participação. Nós estamos concluindo uma hora e 31 minutos de, de reunião, de web meeting. Fantástico, uma, estro, uma troca de, de, de informações muito boa. Muito obrigado pela sua disponibilidade de estar conosco e estar conversando conosco. Cris, gostaria de encerrar, Cris, como presidente da SPRAT. Sim, Lúcio, muito obrigado. Obrigado você, obrigado, Dr. Cole. Excelente noite. Aprendemos e vamos levar essas mensagens para frente. A SPRAT agradece a presença de todos e uma boa noite a todos. Até logo. Obrigado. Thank you very much.